In this video we're going to look at how scientists have determined the relationship between organisms. This includes a number of scientific techniques and observations. The first one is looking at DNA, the second is looking at proteins and the third is looking at behaviour. The first technique we're going to look at is just sequencing DNA. Scientists can extract DNA from cells and they can run this DNA through sequencing machines that will give you a readout of the sequence of bases in the DNA. Scientists can then compare those between different species and from that they can identify spa um, bases that have changed by genetic mutation and we can also make the assumption that the more similar the sequence of bases the more closely related the two species are. This is because mutations or changes to DNA happen randomly over time. So the closer together two organisms are in terms of relatedness, the more recently they have evolved into separate species. Therefore, there has been less time for mutations to change their sequences of DNA. In reality, sequencing DNA can be quite a time-consuming and costly process. Scientists have therefore developed a technique that enables us to make some comparisons between DNA sequences much more quickly. It's based on a principle called DNA hybridization and it exploits the idea of the complementary base pairing between the bases. You can see here that the there is a short DNA sequence from three different species, human, chimp and mouse. The first thing the scientist does is do, um, use a technique which enables us to actually see the DNA. It's quite a small molecule, it's not visible to the naked eye, so what we do is we attach fluorescent markers to the DNA. Notice I've only put fluorescent markers on the chimp DNA. The scientist then heats the DNA and this will break the hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands and leave us with separated single stranded bits of DNA. Here you can see now that um, having heated up our DNA, this is all mixed together in a test tube, we should have the separated strands just moving about randomly. The scientist now cools the DNA and this allows hydrogen bonds to reform between the DNA strands. Most of the DNA um, will hybridise with its own complementary sequence. So most of the DNA will reform as um, double-stranded human DNA and double-stranded chimp DNA. But there are some complementary base pairs between our chimp and human DNA and these will join together to form double-stranded. You can see here that complementary base pairs will form hydrogen bonds between them, but bases that aren't complementary can't form hydrogen bonds. Here and here. Now what happens is that the scientists reheat the DNA again. This will break the hydrogen bonds between the DNA, allowing it the, two, the strands to separate. But what the scientists are looking for this time is the temperature at which they separate. You can see here that the human DNA, all the bases are complementary, so all these hydrogen bonds will need to be broken by heating in order to separate the strands. We can also see here with the chimp DNA that all the bases are complementary, so again, it's going to need quite a high temperature to break all those hydrogen bonds and separate the DNA strands. But we can see here, because we've got some hybrid DNA, which is a mixture of complementary base pairs and non-complementary base pairs, there are fewer hydrogen bonds and therefore it will take less temperature to separate these hybrid pieces of DNA. We can see here that the different DNA hybrids have different numbers of hydrogen bonds because there are different numbers of complementary base pairs. If we had these different DNAs in the test tube, 
we could heat them up and record the temperature at which the DNA strands separated. We should find that the, one, the DNA with fewest complementary base pairs and fewest hydrogen bonds should denature at the lowest temperature. And this gives us a way of working out relatedness because the more differences between the DNA of the different species, the fewer complementary base pairs there will be, therefore fewer hydrogen bonds, therefore the DNA hybrids will separate at a lower temperature. Another technique scientists can use is actually comparing amino acid sequences of proteins. Large numbers of proteins are present in all living organisms. Some of these proteins are very critical for survival and therefore they've been highly conserved over, the, over evolution. However, over time there will be certain differences in the amino acid sequences that develop as a result of mutations and changes to the DNA sequences. Scientists can extract these proteins and actually put them through a protein sequencer and it, it will tell you the order of the amino acids in the primary structure. We can then compare these um, between species. One common enzyme that, um, that scientists have looked at in great detail is called cytochrome C. Now cytochrome C is an enzyme that is found in the mitochondria. It's needed for respiration and as all organisms carry out respiration we find that cytochrome C is present in all organisms. However, there are slight differences between the cytochrome C between different organisms and in the same way as we saw for DNA, um, if we compare the differences, we find that the more the differences between the sequences of cytochrome C, the less related the organisms are. We can use this information to draw a phylogenetic tree by looking at the differences in amino acid sequences. This diagram shows a phylogenetic tree that's been constructed um, by comparing cytochrome C sequences to humans. And we can see that um, human and chimpanzee cytochrome C is 100% identical in terms of the amino acid sequences. Um, mouse, 90%. Donkey, 89%. Horse, 88%. And so on. So from these comparisons of these similarities, we've managed to draw up a, an evolutionary map of the time scale where these different species diverge through evolution. The final technique we're going to look at is called immunological comparison and it uses the differences um, in proteins between species to form a fast way of getting a measure of the degree of relatedness between them. Now the first stage in this process is to produce antibodies to human proteins. Now Human serum is the liquid part of the blood and human serum contains many proteins. This human serum is injected into, into the mouse here and what will happen is that this human serum, the proteins in the human serum will act as antigens because when they're injected into the mouse, the mouse's immune system will see those proteins as foreign and therefore will produce antibodies to them. We can harvest these antibodies from the mouse and these antibodies have an antigen binding site that is specific to human proteins. So if we mix this antibody with human proteins the antibody will bind to the human proteins and this will cause a process called agglutination to take place. The antibody and antigens come together in such a way that they form these very large molecules made up of antibodies and antigens all glued together. And this forms a solid precipitate that we can easily see in the laboratory. Not only can we see it, but we can measure the amount of it. In this test tube has been mixed some mouse anti-human protein antibody and some human protein. The mouse antibody and the human protein have agglutinated 
and formed a large precipitate. If we take our antibodies again and this time mix them with the um, proteins extracted from the plasma or serum of a different species, we would expect that their proteins would be slightly different. Therefore, they're less likely to bind to the antigen binding site of the antibody and form a precipitate. So when we mix our antibody with um, proteins from a different species, there is, um, because they're slightly different shape, they're less likely to bind to the antigen binding site, they're less likely to cause agglutination and the precipitate formed will be less. We can use this to work out the degree of relatedness. The less closely related two species are, the more different their proteins will be. Their proteins are less likely to be recognised by the antigen binding site on the antibody. They won't bind as well. Therefore, there will be less agglutination and less precipitate formed. By measuring the amount of precipitate, we can get an indication of the degree of relatedness. So it's seen here, by mixing the, the antibodies with proteins from different species, we can work out the degree of relatedness just by the amount of precipitate. So the more precipitate, the more closely related. Less precipitate, less closely related. This just summarises the process. The final technique we'll look at is courtship behaviour. Now we know we all evolved from a common ancestor, therefore all organisms share a great many genes in common. And we've also worked out that there's, there's almost as much variation within a species as there is between species. So what is it exactly that ensures a species um, evolves and remains as a species, successfully reproducing and passing on its genes to other members of the species. This is where behaviour comes in. In order for a species to successfully um, reproduce, the members of the same species must be able to recognise each other. And organisms have developed, um, well some organisms have developed numbers of courtship behaviours in order to ensure that um, mating only takes place between members of the same species. Scientists can also compare um, courtship behaviours in order to determine the degree of relatedness between species. Courtship behaviours can change over time. Um, for example, um, some um, members of a population may start responding to different patterns of courtship behaviour. One example is um, tree frogs and tree frogs, um, part of their courtship behaviour is responding to um, a song that one of the um, partner sings and these songs can be sung at different frequencies and different species will respond to different frequencies of songs. Because only um, members of a particular species breed together this means that the tree frog each species is genetically isolated from the other species um, and scientists can also compare the singing frequencies and um, and determine how, um, how closely related these different species are. 